today's video is going to start our annual inspection. And I know last time we started by draining the oil and doing the operational run up, checking compression, stuff like that. But I really wanted to back up a little bit today and start looking at the annual inspection for the Cessna 140 and discuss some of the documentation history that we as inspectors have to do, um, whether that be the log books or uh, the actual type certificate of the aircraft, uh, and just kind of talk about some of these documents. So this is sort of the way I'm planning on doing these next few videos. This video will deal directly with the type certificate and any supplements to that type certificate. So basically what equipment is on the aircraft? Is it supposed to be there? If it's not what originally was certified, do I have the documentation to cover what is on there and is it correct and accurately done? The next step in that is to make sure that all the airworthiness directives have been taken care of and then be the actual inspection itself, the repairs for anything that was unairworthy when I did the inspection, and then the last video, which will probably be a little bit shorter, is going to be the law book entry and how to sign off an annual inspection legally. So that's what we're going to do. So let's jump right into the video today, taking a look at the type certificate and then the airworthiness directives. For every aircraft that operates under uh, the Federal Aviation Regulations, the FAA's regulations for flight under Part 91 or just general operations, not for hire, um, not airline, stuff like that, just general aviation aircraft, you have to complete an annual inspection every 12 calendar months. Well, this one has been several years since it's completed its annual inspection. So before I fly it out of here, even if the aircraft is airworthy, a mechanic that has had two years of experience and obtained his inspector's authorization must inspect this aircraft and sign it off that it is airworthy, that it complies with its type certificate, um, that the airworthiness directives have been completed on it, all the things that are done at an annual inspection. Fortunately, I am a IA. I have uh, gone through all the training and the passed the test for being a inspector. And so what we're going to do today is get started with that inspection. And so before you do any annual inspection, you really need to have a checklist or a guide to make sure you don't forget anything. So for this aircraft, its annual inspection must be done in accordance with Federal Aviation Regulations Part 43, Appendix D. Appendix D lists out all of the required inspection items during an annual inspection. The aircraft has to be at least inspected with that as a guide to make sure that you don't miss anything uh, on the airworthiness requirements. I don't think I mentioned it already, but the Cessna 120 and 140 Association is a uh, online association that you can pay, I think it's $25 a year to become a member of, and it will give you access to a lot of great information. They even have a list of uh, STCs that are um, available for your Cessna 140, uh, your Cessna 140A, or your Cessna 120s. And so this aircraft, one of the things that was in their list is a great annual checklist, which I'm going to be using as we go into this inspection. What you can see is this checklist has a lot of information on it about the aircraft and it's a great record to help me during the inspection and then once I get ready to sign off the aircraft at the end of the inspection I'll have all that information there. I can confirm that I've looked at everything that's on this list and it's a good record for me to make sure I don't miss anything. So the first thing I'm going to do, and I've already printed this out, but every aircraft has a type certificate or basically a birth certificate from the FAA. So when Cessna, in this case, built this Cessna 140, they wrote down the parameters that they have to make sure that this aircraft is operated safely. That includes how much oil can go in the engine, what engine can be on this aircraft, what the speeds this aircraft can sustain are, where the center of gravity range should be, and any particular notes or information pertaining to um, just the operation of this aircraft. So what I've done is I've printed off this uh, type certificate, and I've gone ahead and made some notes on here because we do not have the engine that this uh, aircraft was supposed to have originally. We have a supplement to this type certificate, an STC, Supplemental Type Certificate, that someone has gone through the process of approving 
that this Lycoming 0290 engine can be substituted if you do all the paperwork correctly to go on this aircraft. So what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna go through this and just kind of make sure everything looks good and then we will go into the, uh, the next step. One other quick thing, if I do not reference where you can find a document, Typically that's going to be because it's on the FAA's website, but really everything that we're about to discuss comes from the FAA and you're more than welcome to go online and uh, look at some of the type certificates or other things there. The next thing that I'm going to do once I have looked over my type certificate and made sure that the aircraft is set up legally, that everything is the way it should be on it, is do research on airworthiness directives. Now airworthiness directives are directives that have been issued by the FAA. They are regulatory in nature. You cannot uh, get around them if they apply to you. And they are an addendum to the FAA Part 39 of the Federal Aviation Regulations. To make sure that this aircraft is legal, I have to check the airworthiness directives for the aircraft itself based off its serial number, for the engine based off its serial number, and even for components like the magnetos, the carburetor, the propeller, I have to make sure that there's not any maintenance that has to be done before a certain time or in a certain time interval to make sure that this aircraft can stay airworthy and legal. Um, and so that's the, the longest part and probably going to be the most challenging part of this. I'm not even going to do it here because it's freezing cold out here today. I'm going to do all that research back home with my laptop uh, and see if there's any of these emergency conditions that caused an airworthiness directive to be issued for most aircraft. These airworthiness directives have been signed off already, like a lot of them have been signed off, and you only need to check those recurring ADs. If you remember back to a few videos ago where we discussed the history of this Cessna 140, you'll remember that I said that this Cessna 140 we got a little bit cheaper because it has lost a few of its early records. Um, those early records were destroyed, unfortunately, in a fire. Um, there's just no way to obtain them. So I'm gonna have to research every single one of them and then verify that they've either been complied with by persons unknown. So some mechanic at some time did the uh, repair, did the alteration, did the inspection. Uh, and a lot of times there'll be ways to confirm that that has been done. And then more than likely, the annual entry on this aircraft is going to be massive because I will need to go back in and sign off every one of these airworthiness directives uh, that, that it was complied with by someone unknown. I have personally called our Flight Standards District Office, basically the FAA representative over this region, which is located out in Nashville, Tennessee. And they have stated that that method of compliance is acceptable on items that are recurring or items that obviously I would have to inspect myself, I'll be signing these items off. So here's a great example of a airworthiness directive that does not apply by serial number. So um, airworthiness directive 46-4405 is an airworthiness directive looking at the engine mount bolts, but this aircraft wasn't even manufactured until 1947. So the serial numbers are from 8,001 all the way up to 8,517 and everything in between that. So um, my serial number is above that, so this does not apply. So I'm just going to make a notation that says that this does not apply by serial number and go on to the next one until I find one that does apply. All right, so I am wrapping up this airworthiness directive uh, research and I found a, it's basically a hilarious airworthiness directive, not because of what it is, it's obviously an unsafe condition, but the method of compliance here um, is pretty funny, so I'll just go ahead and show it to you guys here. So according to this airworthiness directive, within the next 12 months of the effective date of this AD, and it's AD 2022-0803, the center seat belt needs to be determined that it is ferrous by placing a magnet on it. Um, this action can be complied with by the operator, owner, or pilot holding at least a private pilot certificate, but then that person must enter into the, or the aircraft's record showing compliance with this airworthiness directive in accordance with, and it lists out how you're supposed to sign off an AD. So it's interesting because this, uh, this particular airworthiness directive uh, 
a mechanic doesn't even have to comply. It, it can be just an owner operator that takes a magnet, sticks it to their center of their seatbelt console, and if it's magnetic, then it's made of steel, and if it's not, then it needs to be replaced. Okay, so I've got everything set up now to do this AD 2022-0803, um, verifying that this piece here, this bracket, is made out of steel. According to the AD, I need to take a magnet, which the end of this uh, flashlight here is magnetic, and I need to verify that this is steel. So I'm gonna do that now. And it very much is um, that attached, and you can see it's just standing there. So, so the air witness directive at this point uh, is complied with. I've verified that this is not aluminum. Since it's not, I don't have to replace it. So now all I'll do is I will make the appropriate uh, documentation in the annuals entry when I go to sign it off in a couple videos that will state that this air witness directive was complied with and what method I used to comply and uh, yeah so sometimes you get airworthiness directives that can be this simple and uh, sometimes they're so bad that they down an aircraft like uh, some wing spar ADs. That's the last one on the airframe this is taking me a couple maybe two or three hours here to go through all these um, I'm not done with just the airframe um, there's some that I need to actually go into and do some more research, but it looks like we went from maybe two dozen ADs down to about a dozen that actually apply, uh, which is good. Um, so that'll be less work uh, in the long run, less inspection than I thought I had to do already. So I have gotten all the airworthiness directives off the FAA's website and I figured out which ones are applicable um, by serial number or configuration. Uh, and I am jotting down some notes on that. Hopefully um, I'll have a chance sometime this week to run up there and uh, take a look at uh, these items as well as continue the inspection. This video I wanted to introduce the paperwork uh, to show the, why this takes so long sometimes. Sure there's instances where there'll be long annuals because of mechanical stuff, but if you're not going to the same inspector on a consistent basis, then every time you go to a new inspector, they're gonna to have to do all of this paperwork over again because it's their license. But they're gonna be tedious and they're gonna take their time and go through and make sure all of these items, whether it's an airworthiness directive or an inspection item, have been covered. Next time I see you guys, hopefully we'll be able to head back to the airplane and actually start doing some of the annual inspection. Thanks for watching again, and as always, have a great day. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.